Um, thank you all so much for sort of trying to get back in. We are a little bit off schedule from what is in your program, um, but we appreciate people sort of shortening today. We're going to extend today's panel by a little bit um, and then uh, and adjust throughout the day. There we go. Wonderful. Um, and then adjust throughout the day slightly. So um, I'm Jojo Roof. I'm the managing director of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics. Um, and first, I just want to echo Kevin and Derek that it feels so incredibly moving to look out and see so many friendly and inspiring faces. Um, we have a, a phenomenal group gathered here today. We have artists and theater practitioners, policymakers, scholars, faculty, students, future leaders from nearly 25 countries. We have representatives from Central and South America, from Europe and the Middle East, from Asia and Africa, and we're thrilled that so many people have flown literally thousands of miles to be with us here today. So it feels very moving. Um, an integral part of our uh, global pre-conference is not just the discussion on stage, but opening up the conversations to questions from you, our audience, as well. So every panel will allow for significant time for that, so have your questions at the ready. Um, and we have mics in the audience, and we'll have volunteers that bring the mics to you so you can stay in your seat. Um, but please do clearly state your name before asking a question or making a comment, just so we have an idea of, of who's talking. Um, throughout the day, we'll also have people joining us via Skype, like we do right now, um, <laughs> uh, and two of which are joining us that way instead of in person because of their own refugee status. So Natalia from Belarus Free Theatre, who is joining us from the UK where she was now living, will be joining us for this first panel. And Reem al Saya, a Syrian refugee turned actress who's living in Amman, Jordan, will be joining us for tonight for prevented presented performances. So it feels apt that we begin our first panel discussion of the day with humanizing exile, a creative response. So this is an opportunity for an extraordinary seven panelists to speak about their own experiences, about how theater can document exile and migration, and what are the conditions and parameters about which exiled artists can and cannot discuss. We're thrilled to have Dr. Nadia Oadat, a Smith Richardson Fellow at New America and frequent collaborator of the lab as our moderator here today. Enjoy. Thank you, everyone. Ooh. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, with me are very impressive and very well accomplished people uh, to discuss, as uh, Jojo said, art and exile and refugees in three different regions in the Middle East, in Latin America, and also in Europe. So with me here is Wendy and Wendy Young. Wendy has received the president, uh, is the president of Kids in Need of Defense, the leading provider of legal services to unaccompanied, unaccompanied migrants and refugee children since its launch in 2009. She brings extensive immigration policy experience to her role, and most recently she served as chief counsel on immigration policy in the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Immigration border secu security and refugees for Senator Edward Kennedy. All of my panelists are very, very accomplished people and I can spend 20 minutes just reading their credentials. So I'm just gonna, uh, because of brevity, just mention a little bit about them and you can I encourage you to read about them in your uh, folder. I also have uh, Marissa, uh, Marissa Chibas is a Don Day Seeking Theater Artist and recipient of the TCG Fox Foundation Fellowship in Distinguished Achievement. She uh, heads the bilingual initiative Don Day uh, Cal Arts that collaborates innovative Latina artists to make adventurous theater. Her solo, Daughter of the Cuban Revolution, produced by Cal Arts Center for New Performance, premiered at uh, Red Cat in LA and went to New York City and various other uh, cities around the world. I also have with me uh, Mr. Costa, Martin Costa. He is a director, playwright, and professor from Mexico City. He has directed over 70 plays since 1987. Uh, Martin toured also all around. He uh, directed a production of Faust. He is a winner of various um, awards, including when he won seven times and when he won twice. I mean, seriously, I encourage you to read more about these impressive panelists. <laughs> How do you win all these awards? What do you do? <laughs> um, I also have with me, uh, from my region, from the Middle East, Taranj uh, Yegz... 
Let me see. Yegi Zayn? Okay. <laughs> um, Turanj brings with her Iranian and Armenian heritage. She is the founding artistic director of Golden Theater Productions, the first American theater company devoted to the Middle East. Music to my ears. Uh, we also have on Skype, as Jojo said, um, Larry and Natalia. And uh, Larry is a British writer, artist, teacher. He was associated for a long time with Darlington College of Arts, where uh, he was the academic director. He became the founding father of Falmouth University's Academy of Music and Arts, uh, Theater Arts. We also have Natalia. She is the uh, founding co-artistic director of Belarus Free Theater, writer, diplomat, human rights activist, and producer. So let's all thank our panelists. And I'm going to start with Latin America since we just saw the phenomenally moving play. So I want to start with you, Wendy, Mursa, and Martin. That was so inspirational. So I want to first give each of you some space, five minutes, to tell us about your background and how you got engaged with this, with this issue. So maybe we'll do it this way. Wendy, we'll start with you. Well, sadly, I need to confess I'm a lawyer. I'm not an artist. <laughs> so but that may be good news for you because my artistic skills are not very good. Um, but I'm with an organization called Kids in Need of Defense, or KIND. We provide uh, pro bono or volunteer legal representation to the thousands of unaccompanied immigrant and refugee children who arrive in the United States each year. And when they are stopped at our border, are placed into deportation proceedings. Um, in recent years, overwhelmingly, the, the population is dominated by Central American children uh, from three countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And w what I think many Americans do not understand is the um, incredibly tragic level of violence that is um, really marking that part of the world today. And these are children who are being driven out of their homes and communities by violence that is specifically targeting them as children. Um, and it's generally created um, by gangs and um, narco cartels. Um, families are making the very desperate choice to put their child on the road alone, sometimes accompanied by a human trafficker or a smuggler, in the desperate search for freedom here. Um, and unfortunately, our system is such that when the kids arrive, like an adult, they're placed into deportation proceedings. They're forced to go into an immigration courtroom, um, raise a defense against deportation in front of an immigration judge with a trial attorney from the Department of Homeland Security arguing for that child's removal. And there's the child standing alone with nobody to help them unless they have a volunteer lawyer. And I've been in immigration courts and seen children as young as three, four, and five years old appearing before judges with nobody to help them. And they're supposed to be able to demonstrate that they have a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. Try doing that when you're three years old. Um, so this is, this is what we do. We try to help these kids through these proceedings. And what we find is that children who have counsel are five times more likely be, to be awarded some uh, form of protection and allowed to remain in the United States. Um, and we have over a 90% success rate in our cases. Mm -hmm. But currently, over 50% of these kids are going through those proceedings without lawyers. So that's what we do. 50%? One out of every two kids. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so um, I can share with you a little bit of the genesis of the project. Um, in the winter of 2014, I um, was re healing from uh, major spine surgery and the loss of my mother, and I was um, alone, uh, healing a lot. And I was haunted by a story that I had read uh, several years ago about a teenage a uh, Mexican-American boy from Texas who was mentally challenged and he was deported um, by accident and his parents didn't know where he was for three weeks. 
So for three weeks, uh, and I was just haunted with this idea. He finally was reunited with his family, but I had ne I didn't know <laughs> um, about uh, unaccompanied child migrants. I started reading about it. Um, and uh, there was an article in the LA Times in which two people were quoted, Elizabeth Kennedy, who's a Fulbright scholar and at the time was working in El Salvador with children who had been deported back, and Susan Terrio uh, from Georgetown University, who uh, was writing a book that is now out called Whose Child Am I? Uh, this was a Sunday that the LA Times article came out, and I emailed them both, found their information online, emailed them both, and heard back from them that day. And I thought, OK, I'm going to go to uh, the CalArts Center for New Performance team and you know, say, we have to do a piece about this. This is huge. Um, uh, Elizabeth was able to connect me. Both Elizabeth and Susan were advisors on the project. I interviewed them. I went to a shelter in San Diego uh, where I saw a group of kids, uh, uh, recent arrivals. I interviewed volunteers who were going to the shelter. I did a lot of research. Uh, and I did research for uh, almost a year, um, and then um, during that process, we we needed a director. And uh, Martina Costa has directed for Duende Cal Arts before. He did a beautiful production by Alejandro Ricaño called Timbuktu that was performed both in the U.S. and in Mexico. Uh, half of the artists were from this country and half from Mexico, uh, and. Uh, we really wanted to work with this incredible visionary director. We knew that it would be also because our countries, the U.S. and Mexico, are so um, involved and responsible in many ways for the crisis, it seemed like this is the perfect partnership. Um, and uh, so he came on board and we did a, a workshop last spring. Uh, basically generating material with an extra extraordinary team of uh, actors and designers um, and put up the show uh, in, in uh, this past uh, spring in Los Angeles in two locations. One was uh, an outdoor uh, park in Lincoln Park in downtown Los Angeles. Um, and then also at Garesen LA. Garesen serves um, uh, 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 Central American uh, refugees uh, and migrants uh, with uh, pro bono legal services as well as educational services. And along with the production, we also have been doing these workshops uh, titled Yo Tambien Soy Un Ser, I Too Am Somebody. Uh, and they are youth empowerment workshops with our whole team, designers, actors, uh, everybody involved, um, basically focusing on some of the effects of the hate language uh, that um, uh, towards immigrants that's happening in the country and how that affects the body. So uh, in the workshops, we um, do different kinds of physical improvs with the with the, um, the, none of them, uh, most of the, the, our attendees of the workshops were not performers, um, but uh, they really took to the work and they would step into the body of a hero of their choice and walk around with that uh, and feel the effects of that and write from that voice. Um, I also um, interviewed uh, seven recent arrivals, kids who had made this journey themselves at the age 13, 14, from a local high school where we have a year-long writing program, CalArts has a year-long year writing program with, uh, and those seven um, young dreamers uh, were integral from the beginning of the process. So they saw a workshop, they gave us feedback, uh, they were a part of readings, they took the Yo Tambien Soy Un Ser workshop they were there at opening, and we continue to be in contact with them. Um, and one of the things that I want to share with you um, in terms of belonging and finding home is that uh, these seven kids, uh, during the course of this process, we saw the power of our work as theater artists. We saw their empowerment uh, of, of having their stories told and witnessed publicly and the importance of that. And there's a real hunger for that. Uh, we've gotten responses from uh, middle schools, elementary schools, high schools, colleges, uh, professional theaters around the country who are really hungry for this kind of work that specifically represents this uh, community. And we're 
really proud to be doing this. Thank you, Marisa. Martin? Okay. Um, as Marisa, uh, I am an artist, not a lawyer, so I will talk about me. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, I was a very shy kid when I was in junior high school, and I, but with a very strong ideas about many things. And I did promise never to come to United States because I, I was very angry because many, many things. But I've been weak and I came. In 1993, uh, I, had, I did accept, uh, accept uh, a grant for, to be in a residence in Art Awareness, uh, three hours far from New York at the north. And I s spent these months uh, working on one of my first pieces, uh, working about James Joyce novel and, and materials from him. Um, talking with an artist, with, uh, which I was sharing uh, a, a workshop, uh, he told me, 1993, he told me, you are the first Mexican who I am talking, and there are saying something intelligent and not, are not washing the dishes. Uh, and I didn't know what to say. I, actually, I didn't know what to think about it. And I say, thank you. <laughs> I am very, very surprised because I didn't notice how some artists look to other artists <laughs> at that moment. But uh, many people around me at that moment encouraged me to do my work and to express my ideas. And I am very thankf thankful for to all these people, but I am very thankful to the guy who told me that. And because my world turned around totally, and, and I have a perspective of what I want to do and what I had to do with my work and with my life, actually. Um, and that's migration for me. Uh, that's a, a, a way to confront your fear and make a trouble and confront uh, what do you want to do? What are you dreaming to be? And to have the effort to do it. Uh, so uh, I did, and from this moment to on, until today, I, I had a beautiful, great journey. And part of the journey was to meet Marisa and to do a great partnership. <laughs> uh, she talked me about uh, these kids, migrant migrant kids, and I didn't know anything about them, even if they are crossing my own country, and I was so surprised about it. I, I did know about migrants coming from Central America, especially because six years ago there, there were a massacre in San Fernando, Tamaulipas, where 72 migrants, Central American migrants, were kidnapping and finally, finally dead. Uh, but I didn't know that the kids come unaccompanied to America, and it was a very surprise for me, and I felt very shame because uh, I didn't know. Uh, so it was a great opportunity working and, and sharing the experience with CalArts to talk about it. Uh, actually pushed me to do a new, a new play and now about the Las Patronas, who are a group of women that um, give food every day of their lives to the migrants that cross mm. close to their, their own little town, named Amatlan de los Reyes. Um, so these people do that because they wanted to do. In the last 25 years ago, they are working on it and with no support of anybody, any institution, mm. with the support of many people, of course. Uh, and and I, I feel that we have a great weapon to, to, to talk about this, because if more people know about what these people are doing, I think we, we can make conscience, make, we can open doors, and we can make maybe the, the, right, the right questions, because we have not the answers. And this is a great thing for theater. We don't, we don't need 
answers. We need, we need, we need the right, right questions. Uh, I'm actually going to go to Larry and uh, Natalia over Skype. Would you tell us about your work? Hi, everyone. I hope you hear us. Yeah, we can hear. Great. Uh, I don't see audience, hope, but I, I, based on Skype screen, I could imagine you see very big faces of us. Yes. <laughs> can you hear their laughter? <laughs> there are quite a few of them. <laughs> yeah, it was a great laughter. So we hear you guys. Uh, I would start from uh, just checking. Uh, it's kind of a small geography lesson. Do you know, guys, where Belarus is? Yes. It seems like it's very different uh, from laughter. Laughter was very loud. <laughs> <laughs> Let's and give her a loud uh, yes. <laughs> Do you hear this? <laughs> so before we said... Um, that Belarus is located in between uh, Poland and Russia. And then uh, my husband, he said, you know what, I came up, uh, came up with a great idea. Check with people, do they know where Russia is located? <laughs> Guys, do you know where <laughs> Russia is located? <laughs> yeah, now I hear, you know, yeah. So just to make sure, Russia is located in between Belarus and China. <laughs> So <laughs> now you will definitely know how important and big Belarus is. <laughs> so this is the country from where uh, I come personally. Larry is lucky he was born in uh, the UK. Uh, that is still part of the European Union. Everything might be changed. <laughs> <laughs> For at least few more days. <laughs> At least one more day. One more day. So hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then we're moving to you guys. <laughs> uh, we will have more refugees, but from the UK now. <laughs> and then you will understand what it means humanizing exile when Brits will come to your country. <laughs> so uh, uh, the country is under dictatorship our country, Belarus, for 22 years. Uh, and this is where we do theater. Uh, personally, me and my husband were called uh, public enemies or enemies of the state. And it means different things. It's, uh, it means you lose your job, you lose your education. Uh, it means uh, your parents lose your job. It means uh, apartments of your parents, as it was in our case, they're raided by KGB. Uh, it means that uh, your children are hunted by KGB in order for them to be sent to orphanages, as it was happening with us. Uh, and then at some point, uh, when you become a refugee, uh, many different start, things start to happen as well. Uh, you don't have home anymore because your home uh, is back in your country. You don't have friends because they're either in jail or they're in exile in different countries. But in our case, we have a unique situation. 29 of members of Belarus Free Theatre are still underground in Belarus. And they perform there on a weekly basis and uh, they teach students on a daily basis. And our real life is split it into, part, into two parts. It's life in London uh, with a new world of uh, understanding democracy for us personally and understanding that it's not a very easy system and you need to dig very deep in order to find different problems under that particular system. But still, you have people back there, and in order for us to work with them, we get on Skype with them, as we did today with you. And we teach. So today, before getting on Skype with you, I was working with uh, Maria Alokhina from Pussy Riot, 
uh, who was in jail for two years in Russia, because now we do a big uh, show together with a member of Pussy Riot, with Masha, and we talk about contemporary artists and their role in uh, different societies and how politicians use them from both sides. And trying to say that we are not heroes, we are not victims, we are contemporary artists, and we are very much interested in different interpretations of exile, because exile for us, it's a very complicated thing. Exile for us, it's amazing uh, opportunity to meet absolutely fantastic people who work with us in the UK. Uh, but at same time, our existence is under very big question in terms of financial support. So uh, besides, uh, we are not with you now uh, based on a very simple thing. We are refugees in the UK, but it's a very complicated process. And now in order for us to extend our live in the UK, we applied for that status, but it means we don't have any single document. So if we are stopped in the street by police in London, the only way for them to identify us, it would be to take us to a police department and fingerprint. When we get from Italy to Heathrow Terminal 3, we are detained for 15 minutes, 15 minutes of shame for home office in the UK, because they terminate our leave to remain in the UK. So exile is not a very simple thing. The only thing as people do who come from dictatorship, they can't stop. They will continue to push. And we will continue to push on a personal level. And besides, we will continue to push on a level of artists. Um, Natalia has spoken so well that I won't add very much time at all. Um, perhaps just to say from my perspective as a, an educator by trade that just as Natalia has spoken about her experience of being exiled out of Belarus, so she's not allowed there and she's not allowed to travel to Washington, D.C., because um, she has no travel document, she's stateless. Um, the work I do with the company, with Belarus Free Theatre, is primarily uh, education and an idea, a principle, that has been entirely exiled from Belarus is the principle of an academically free interrogative education, be it in the arts or anywhere else. And one of the least well-known but most extraordinary things about Belarus Free Theatre is the fact that we run underground, in exile, but inside the country, a two-year uh, theatre education programme for... We enrol 15 students a year to Fortinbras Laboratory Theatre. Fortinbras, as you know, the last man standing in Shakespeare's Hamlet. So we have an underground laboratory theatre running full-time education programme for students in Minsk. It's the only academically free education available in the country of Belarus. There's the wonderful European Humanities University in exile outside of the country. But if you want to do a hardcore arts programme in Minsk, there's one place to do it, and it's tucked away, a humanising refuge, a sanctuary of free thought and activistic self-determination um, run by... Uh, Natalia and the crew in Belarus Free Theatre. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but education is uh, a thing we do in country. Thank you, Larry and Natalia. And uh, Torange? Um, hello. Uh, so I came to the United States as a very opinionated 14 year old who did not want to stay in the US. Uh, during a time when there was a revolution happening in Iran and my family didn't feel that it was safe for me to uh, be in Iran. Uh, what, uh, what I was told that uh, the trip would be for just four months through the summer and when things calm down, I would return. Uh, things did not calm down and uh, I did not return. So... Uh, Gradually, the rest of my family moved to the U.S., and uh, it became clear that we need to uh, make a fresh start of it here, which we were lucky enough to be able to do and privileged to be able to do. Uh, but it did mean that I had to uh, 
you know, sort of redefine myself uh, as an immigrant, and I had to um, explore this new territory of living between uh, two identities. And because I'm also half Armenian, uh, living among uh, three identities. So uh, it was an interesting period of um, growing up in the U.S. As it happened, I went to a different high school every year. So I actually went to four different high schools, uh, which uh, in a way didn't help me build relationships as a teenager. Um, but what it did do, it actually pushed me further into theater because that was the only place where I felt at home in, in a way. Um, and uh, by the time I finished high school, I wanted to pursue theater as a professional uh, career. Uh, but coming from an immigrant family, uh, economic independence was very important to us. Uh, so I pursued a career in, uh, in the sciences to be able to find a job right away and make money, which I did, and then I pursued theater. <laughs> and uh, by the time I moved to San Francisco, um, uh, the plan was to uh, pursue a, um, an MFA in theater. Uh, and by the time I got my graduate degree, uh, I uh, established a theater company. Um, and the idea of this theater company really was born, I think, the day I landed at Kennedy Airport mm -hmm. and was asked about my identity and my, um, uh, you know, why am I here? Who am I? Why do I think I belong here? Um, and sort of negotiating all of those complicated uh, issues, you know, as a 14-year-old, I think all of that was building up. And uh, when I was studying theater uh, and I was auditioning for graduate programs, uh, a, a number of times I was told that uh, because of my looks and because of my accent, I would never be cast in a leading role in, in American theater. Um, and that discouraged me a little bit, but by the time I did finish my graduate studies, what I realized was that I, I'm not alone. Uh, I have stories that I want to tell, and I will write my own stories, and I will act in my own plays with my accent and with my looks. And, uh, and as soon as I started doing that, I realized I met other artists that are in uh, similar shoes that are looking for an artistic home, and that was the impetus for uh, founding Golden, Golden Thread Productions, which is our theater company in San Francisco devoted to the Middle East. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about it uh, in our conversation. I do have marketing material, like a good artistic <laughs> director. So I have bookmarks, and I have my business cards here, so. Uh, thank you, everyone. So you know, one, one thought that really uh, is pressing is politicians and, and the hell need to see these plays because they talk as if all oh, these people, why are they coming towards us? And there's zero recognition that American foreign policy has something to do with why sometimes people leave their countries, that we are not completely innocent of what happens. And I know in our region in the Middle East, so, so you support dictators and you flood the Middle East with weapons and then why are these people coming? Uh, you would do the same thing if you were under attack. So you really educate on the truth behind what's happening, but you also humanize. Ultimately, we're all humans and we, we're all seeking um, safety and, and prosperity. And so are you having any efforts to actually educate Congress and politicians? This is one question. And the other is, and because we have to st stop at one, and I really want to engage the audience. The other question is, I know that as an immigrant myself, uh, even when you leave your country, you practice some sort of censorship, what you can and can't do, because most often you, you have uh, relatives who are still there. So to what extent have, um, has this experience of, of being away yourself from that and dealing with people who just came or people who are maybe on route or wanting to leave or how has this influenced your work? 
And I'll, I'll let you all take two minutes to answer, and then we'll open it to the audience. Uh, I'll just, um, with the first question, uh, I actually had a meeting this week uh, at the Capitol with a uh, staff of Congressman Bitsera's office uh, from Los Angeles, and we are uh, uh, in the process of uh, bringing shelter to the Capitol, to the theater in the Capitol. That's wonderful. Because you hear all this xenophobic language that's really offensive from top politicians, and it's inexcusable. Wendy? We do spend a great deal of time working with Congress, with the administration, with the various federal agencies that are involved in immigrant and refugee issues to try and raise their awareness about why people are fleeing Central America. I think there's, a, a, again, a tremendous level of ignorance about what's happening mm -hmm. very close to our borders. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think a lack of sense of responsibility because, as you were saying, this this really, the U.S. involvement in that region has a lot to do with what's happening currently. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Frankly, um, I think the, the dysfunctionality of Congress right now has actually helped us <laughs> on the Central American issue mm -hmm. because most of the response that we saw when the child migration crisis really exploded in 2014 was a backlash against these children and a oh. desire to really cut back on the protections that are available to, the, to them under U.S. law, which were very hard-fought hard legislative victories over a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as we head into the fall, we'll see what comes next, but it's, it's alarming to us to see kind of the, the tone, obviously, of the rhetoric that's, that's happening currently around immigration and refugee issues. Well, I think if we can not educate people on the Congress, we can educate people on on the. Who elects them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, first time when I went in Calarts, uh, we were making a play about uh, drugs and cartels, and one student asked me, uh, "What do we have to do with with that, and, and what America has to do with that?" And I said, "You have the weapons, uh, which." The cartels kill people, and mm -hmm. this is a very complex uh, by circle. Uh, so, but we, we can we can share that we can share that information. Uh, in my country, um, we have not really censorship as an artist. Um, only if you say something about the Virgen de Guadalupe, it could be very, very, very dangerous. Uh, actually, it ha happened things. Like, like uh, people coming into the stage and push the, the actors. 1982, wow. for example, the, all the actors went to the hospi hospital after that just because they were talking about the Virgen de Guadalupe. But, but we have a very complex uh, instrument in the cultural life in Mexico because there are many artists with a grant, like me, for example. But we can do our work about anything social, political issue that we want, but they make the way that nobody see our work. So it's something mm -hmm. uh, difficult because uh, we have not infrastructure to, mm -hmm. to show, to share our, our work, uh, but we can talk about anything. Uh, and we have to because our governments are doing very, very bad things. At this moment, are killing the teachers. Oh. This week, they killed six teachers in, in, wow. in Oaxaca because they are protest against the new reform of the education, which n nobody on the government can explain what is it. Uh, so we have to deal with that, and mm, our way to do it is with art. So our audience is mainly the voter, the public, and in every uh, play and production, it's, a, it's a, a real focus for us to connect the stories if, if uh, the play is taking place in the Middle East, to actually link it uh, to our lives, to our daily lives. Why does it matter? How, how does it impact us or how do we impact it? So that dialogue and that uh, you know, sort of clarifying, or at least uh, I loved what you said about helping people ask better questions. It's not so much about providing the answers or the solutions, but giving some information so that people can ask better questions. 
uh, because it's, it's uh, you know, <laughs> despite the U.S. having been involved in the Middle East for, what, more than 50, 60 years, uh, the amount of uh, misconception and misinformation about the Middle East in the U.S. is just mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. And uh, every day we have to answer uh, questions that may seem silly uh, until you actually remind yourself you know, this person asking me this question is the person who will cast a vote in November, and it's my responsibility to answer as truthfully and informatively as I possibly can. So we take that responsibility very seriously, and with every play we try to uh, present, you know, complicated, uh, political situations that may seem complicated and beyond our understanding or beyond our uh, ability to impact, we present it as a human story uh, in ways that hopefully invite uh, engagement and deeper inquiry. Thank you. Larry and Natalia? i say a few quick words, but Natalia can speak um, particularly on what we've done with the UK government. Um, and I mean, the two things I would say very quickly, one's just a, t a tactical, practical thing, which is we have um, a member of the UK Parliament on our board um, who's chair of the Parliamentary Subcommittee for Women and Equalities. So in terms of some of the stuff we want to do, having a trustee on our company board who's uh, one of the UK's more enlightened and reasonable mm -hmm. parliamentarians has been a useful tactic. Mm -hmm. um, but what a lot of what the Belarus Free Theatre does in its theatre making is it collides um, the micro narrative story of the real experiences and lives of individuals mm -hmm. with big geopolitical mm -hmm. shifts and structures. Mm -hmm. That's a, a key methodological tactic. Yeah. So the company has un uniquely in the UK performed and lobbied actively in the UK Parliament, so on the Congress floor. But I'll, I'll let Natalia talk a bit about... And we're doing it again in September when we'll take Petra Pavlensky and Masha from Pussy Riot into, into mm -hmm. Parliament. But that's not straightforward, but Natalia can say a bit more about that particular tactic. Uh, we are the campaigning uh, theatre, and it's interesting that that particular framing uh, came up uh, only when we uh, became um, um, refugees, because we never separated uh, any activities. We've been performing, producing, uh, educating and campaigning. Uh, that was a nature of the company. So every single show uh, will have its particular campaign. If we have the issue of political kidnappings and murders in those, we will run the campaign against kidnappings and murders. Uh, and uh, it, because of it, uh, there were awards given to us, like French Republic of Human Rights um, gave us a prize uh, for doing that particular campaign, it was never given to any cultural institution before. So the whole idea of merging theatre and campaign was not acceptable in the UK because it was called political lobbying. Mm. And uh, it was necessary for us to frame it uh, the way it will be absolutely clear human rights campaigning. Uh, and it's exactly what we do. We campaign specifically for very precise human rights, whether it will be LGBT community, we work with them, whether it will be rights of disabled people, uh, it will be led by disabled people uh, back in Belarus. If we talk about death penalty, uh, we will organize uh, protests uh, we still call it protest, even though I found a way how to frame it in the UK. You need to call it artistic stunt. Uh, but then uh, you do what you need to do. And what Natalia is referring to is uh, UK legislation which um, prevents you from having charitable status if you're a political party, pressure group. or So we are, mm. we're a theatre company, but a campaigning and teaching theatre. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, then uh, in terms of, uh, for example, last year, uh, it was Belarus Free Theater who organized the first public debate on artistic freedoms in the UK. It was not about Belarus, it was about the UK, because there are signs of um, self-censorship and mm. uh, there is no guidelines for policing. Uh, and it's happened first time ever in the house, uh, Houses of uh, Parliament and the Speaker's Apartment. Uh, and um, it is happening now with the refugee crisis as well. Uh, we worked very closely with an organization that is called Good Chance Calais. This is the group of uh, just two young English playwrights who open the dome in uh, jungles. Uh, it's a refugee camp in Calais in France. It's 50 minutes by train from London, King's Cross, uh, to France, and you are exactly in absolutely parallel reality among 7,000 of refugees, now 5,000, because in February, mm -hmm. French government demolished uh, part of the camp. So we've been working very closely with them, and then lobbying interests uh, of refugees uh, in Brussels, uh, so I went to talk to Brussels Forum and I talked to Martin Schulz, who is the president of European Parliament. So for us, it's not possible to separate uh, what we do artistically and um, mm -hmm. on human rights. I mean, this is the, the power of arts, that it brings the human, the geopolitical and the personal all uh, at once. So let's open it to the audience. Uh, like Jojo said, there are microphones. Please raise your hand if you have a question and don't forget to state your name clearly. Michael Feldman, Create Equity. Uh, I wanted to give Wendy uh, credit where credit's due. Uh, as a former uh, committee staffer in the Senate, uh, you are a theater producer. They're called committee hearings. <laughs> and how do you take theater works in the traditional sense and make them uh, committee hearing ready? Because as we know, that's where you actually get the messages in the uh, congressional or parliamentary systems so that they actually can turn into legislations or report language that influence what uh, executive branch agencies do. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's very true. It is, it's political theater. Um, I think very much what my co-panelists have been saying is what we need to do with Congress, which is to humanize these issues. Um, in the immigration and refugee world, I think we spend a lot of time talking about numbers. And there's something that is very, very dehumanizing about data. So um, I did have the opportunity to testify before the House Judiciary Committee this spring. It's not a particularly friendly committee on immigration issues. Um, and what I did was get up there and tell stories. And um, I think it, it had some impact. I'm not going to say I persuaded anybody on that committee, but I think it at least gave them pause and made it harder for them to engage in the, the kind of anti-immigrant, xenophobic, racist language that they might normally engage in. If there are no questions, we'll break for lunch and you can always speak to any of our panelists uh, during lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.